Hello everyone, welcome to my review of the coffee table book, David Fincher's Mind Games by Adam Naiman. Um, this review will start out with a flip through of the entire book, and then at the end I will give you my complete thoughts on the book, as well as whether or not I think you should go pick it up at the store. Please enjoy. Hello everyone, this is the flip through portion of the David Fincher Mind Games coffee table book review video. Um, this is obviously my copy of the book. Uh, you can see it has this very interesting cover that sort of is like puzzle pieces coming together to end up spelling David Fincher and then Mind Games in a normal font. Uh, makes sense, the design language makes sense considering uh, the filmography of David Fincher. If you're very familiar with his work, you know that he has a lot of films where you're constantly guessing, trying to put pieces together of a narrative um, in order to figure out what's going on. A lot of that has to do with a lot of his work being in the crime genre. And then we have obviously Adam Nyman, forward by Bong Joon-ho, who we all know um, from Parasite fame, as well as other films like Mother and Memories of Murder and stuff like that. So, you open up the book, we have this very interesting um, kind of like gray grid webbing, <laughs> I guess you would say. Let me move this candle a little bit out of the way. Um, you know, nothing too special there. It is kind of glossy a little bit. Then we have David Fincher, Mind Games, Adam Nyman. All right, and then another title page with the, you know, all the other things about the um, publisher. Then we have a table of contents, uh, which is very helpful, obviously. Uh, know what part of the book, if you may be more interested in a certain part of the book, this can help you. Then we have the forward by Bong Joon-ho. This is actually very cool because we obviously have it in Korean, which is the language that Bong Joon-ho speaks, and then we have it in English. It also says that this was written on March 16th, 2021. So that's a great forward um, reading how Bong Joon-ho is just a really big fan of David Fincher and his works and how they've sort of, you know, inspired him and things of the sort. Then we go into an introduction. Now this is a very interesting portion of the book because this portion of the book deals a lot with um, sort of the influences of David Fincher uh, the type of movies that you can kind of see being very um, important to his work within the history of cinema, you know, F for fake. Um, and they basically kind of like do a thing about comparing those types of movies with his works and how they all sort of connect. It's sort of an impromptu history of the things that made David Fincher quote unquote which is pretty cool, I might say. Um, yeah, and then there's all these great photos. Chinatown, Wizard of Oz, one of my favorite movies. Chinatown, maybe my second favorite Roman Polanski film. Uh, we have the screen from Seven. We have this one from House of Cards. All right, so then we get into a little bit more of the history of David Fincher with this section of the book, which has, which has to deal with... Um, the music videos and the commercials, which is where David Fincher obviously started his career. Um, people who are a little bit familiar with his sort of story, you understand that. He made music videos for Madonna, made the very famous baby smoking in a womb ad. So we kind of go through that. It's obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of reading. So then when we get into the crime scenes chapter, this is where we start talking about our, our, obviously the crime films within David Fincher's filmography. We open up with seven, very beautiful artwork, as you can see here. Uh, seven is actually one of my favorite David Fincher films. Uh, I really, really have a good <laughs> relationship with that movie. I actually watched it not too long ago. Um, I want to say within the last year, and it really, really struck a chord with me in a way that it hadn't before. Um, yeah, I love just these double page spreads of scenes as well. The only obvious downside of a double page spread is that the crease within the book, the crevice in the middle of the book, sort of, you'll lose some information there. 
another cool thing about all of this uh, stuff in the book, specifically when it comes to talking about the movies, is that you get little tidbits and stuff here in different parts that'll refer to, you know, either the pictures or whatever to sort of talk about like what is going on or different technical aspects. So it says this split screen composition ominously doubles Detective Mills with the suspect in the lust murder, anticipating his own impending manipulation by John Doe into becoming Wrath. So yeah, very, very cool stuff, if I might add. I'll move this light just a teeny bit. So that's, so that's one of the interesting things, is that, you know, when you're reading this book, the book is a book of analyses of Fincher's work, right? It is looking at the technical aspects, it's looking at the stories that he has decided to take on, um, and really dissect them in a way that I guess is fitting, considering David Fincher's works are sort of works of dissection, right, of various things within America, um, social, political climates, um, the human condition, probably more than anything else. Uh, this awesome, great influences page, uh, that I really, really, I really, really like when they do this because it really lets you connect this work to other works, right? Unless you connect David Fincher's work to other works within his, within just the history of cinema and, and the world really. And that's something I think is very important because, you know, when you're looking at movies, I feel like it's okay to like look at a movie to critique a movie like sort of in a vacuum, right? I don't necessarily have an issue with that. And I do it occasionally as well. Beautiful two page spread from Zodiac. But um, it's always interesting if you're looking for um, a way to sort of connect these works to the world. This book kind of gives you a guide on doing that as well which is always very cool um, because it does give you like, it's almost like a supplemental reading in a way, supplemental viewing, supplemental reading, a way to really like get even further connected to the work that you may have already seen. You know what I mean? I like that stuff. I like, uh, so we got like Bullet and Dirty Harry and Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, The Most Dangerous Game, you know, really, really cool stuff. And then this is Mindhunter actually. Um, another really, really good, let's see what the cover page for Mindhunter is. Oh, look at this. I love this behind the scenes picture of David Fincher right here. The man himself. That's actually really, really awesome. If, if I'm being honest, that's really, really cool. I love seeing stuff like that. Is also, you get, you get these cool, like just, uh, like all the panels kind of like lead it. Like this is the intro of Mindhunter basically, like. Not frame by frame, but sort of like shot by shot in a way, which is really, really awesome. So again, it kind of it, all this book does is really follow the same format. You can have all these images, you have the analyses happening, um, and then over on the margins, you'll have, um, you know, kind of different analyses, dissections, tidbits, um, things of the sort to sort of, you know, connect you to either the production process or the creative process or maybe a little small analysis or, or observation about why something was done the way it was done within, within the film. All right, let me have maximum security. So this is Alien 3, which is a film that, it's actually interesting seeing this in here. I guess they really can't they kind of can't just let this not be in here, but this is a work that David Fincher doesn't really consider his own, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, he's very unhappy with, with specifically Alien 3. This was the first film of his career and how it kind of turned out. Um, he, did, he doesn't really believe it's indicative of his work, which obviously many who have seen the film would and the rest of his filmography would probably agree with that in terms of quality standpoint. All right, so what is, so now we have Panic Room, right? We've all, well, maybe not all of us have seen Panic Room. It's a much smaller film by David Fincher, you know. It's a 
kind of like a, a contained thriller heist type of movie. <laughs> um, but obviously lots of great, um, great setup for tension and, and things of the sort. Jared Leto's in it. Uh, a young Kristen Stewart is in it. Um, it's very, very, it's very, it's, it's a movie that goes under even my radar. I'm not necessarily super big <laughs> on Panic Room. I'm not like a Panic Room devotee by any means. Uh, but it is a movie I did see once and I actually did enjoy it. Again, the influence. Straw Dogs. I actually just watched this movie again recently. Really, really loved it. Big fan of Straw Dogs. All right, so let me keep going. Behind the scenes picture of David Fincher. Love that. Reality Bites. So then we have like the game. I'll kind of try and get through these a little bit faster, but I do want to get you guys at least a, a good sense of what's in this book, right? Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen the game. I don't own it on, I own it on normal Blu-ray, but I know it's in the Criterion Collection, so it's a book, it's a movie that I have to sort of obtain in the Criterion Collection at some point. Not my favorite Fincher movie, though. I know a lot of people really, really love it. Maybe I have to rewatch it. It's been a few years since I've seen the movie, so my opinion will probably change with age. Uh, I do like Michael Douglas as an actor. I actually recently watched Wall Street, and I thought that was a really, really cool movie, so. So yeah, so this book, it goes movie by movie, um, but not in chronological order, obviously. It goes through theme, in a way, to sort of uh, kind of talk about the differences like, it, it wants to group the movies together in order to sort of give you a, a look into how exactly he um, analyzes certain, uh, you know, themes, basically, and use, you know, whatever movies that they actually put together in order to connect them all through as well. So that's actually something a little interesting and um, purposeful about how the book is set up, because obviously most books would probably just go in order, whereas this book is like, no, we can go theme by theme and then connect each, you know, analyze each movie and connect each movie through the themes um, that they sort of look into and analyze and things of the sort. So that's really awesome. I think that's really cool. Fight Club, awesome movie, iconic movie, obviously. Uh, we have Bob <laughs> hugging the narrator. Um, you know, this is a movie that is obviously very famous and infamous at the same time, uh, depending on how it's been read, uh, which is, you know, something that is very, <laughs> that's, that's one of the weird things about a lot of controversial movies, right? A lot of controversial movies, um, are sort of subject to how they are read, right? And the scrutiny brought upon them is, is really a product of, of that. They're almost slaves to interpretation, which I think is fascinating. Fight Club is one of those, Fight Club is one of those, um, one of those movies. Then we have The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, a movie I don't think I've seen enough. Um, I think I've seen it two or three times, and I think I need to watch it again. I'm coming up on a, on a third watch, I think. Um, Brad Pitt, Kate Blanchett, iconic movie, one of his Best Picture nominees. I remember when the trailer for this movie was coming out, and I was just like blown away by the fact, um, not even really that Brad Pitt was like aging backwards but more of like the spectacle of some of the things going on in the movie like the world war one it looked very beautiful too but uh, i wasn't necessarily uh a devotee of cinema yet it was just a movie that i had heard about i was very young i was only like 11 years old when this movie came out so yeah i love how you can sort of you get the sort of like neo-noir you can see how noir um, films inspired David Fincher a lot in the cinematography uh, collaboration between him and Jeff Cronenweth, uh, which I think is actually really cool. Awesome. The Great Gatsby. That's a, I actually want to either read the book. I, I want to watch the movie, the Boz Lerman movie again, but uh, I, I, I probably should read the book again. I haven't read it since high school. But yeah, Fincher, I believe I don't, this is, looks like the set of Fight Club. The Social Network. A uh, movie that everybody is very familiar with. A lot of people would say this is Fincher's best film. Love this. This is really cool. Uh, man. This, I, this honestly, talking about the social network is almost like tiresome in a way because it's like, what can you say 
it hasn't already been said about this film. It is just one of the most iconic films of the last 20 years. It is obviously, arguably, the best thing Aaron Sorkin has ever written, the best thing David Fincher has ever written, I mean, directed. Um, weird, it should have been, a, it probably should have won Best Picture that year. I'd have to, like, relook at everything that was nominated, but it feels like it probably should have, considering the, not only the impact and the pertinence, but the, um, it's almost, not its perception, but its ability to sort of predict right where we sort of we're going in the future right through analyzing probably the biggest event one of the biggest uh technological events of the last century <laughs> which is kind of startling in a way girl with the dragon tattoo one of my favorite david fincher movies um really really love rooney mara and daniel craig in this film uh stellan skarsgård i believe is also in this movie very, very cool. Very, very dark. Very long movie, but I enjoy that, and I love the darkness of not only the narrative, but the cinematography, um, the themes, the things that it kind of delves into. The script, I think, is very engrossing. I'm even super into the, um, like, the crime itself, like, the crimes committed. I have sort of, like, a morbid curiosity um, streak in me, so that movie kind of scratches that as well great picture that I think we've all seen of David Fincher, I think, at this point. Gone Girl, probably like the most scathing movie David Fincher's ever made about media. All right, you get to see these very, very cool images. I just love that, that this book is presented the way it is. Very, very violent scene in the movie for anybody who's, who's seen it uh, with Neil Patrick Harris. Um... I love Ben Affleck in this movie, obviously. We all love um, Rosamund Pike. Carrie Coon, I feel like, doesn't get enough love, though, uh, in this movie. Dang, that's so interesting, the Eyes Wide Shut. The still of Eyes Wide Shut is... Um, is So what's it say? Fincher mentioned Stanley Kubrick's valedictory drama as an inspiration during filming. I That makes sense, considering if you've seen Gone Girl, if you've seen Eyes Wide Shut, I feel like, I feel like that that's a... That's a statement that doesn't exactly um, come out of nowhere. David Fincher directing Ben Affleck, who was actually preparing to uh, to be Batman when he was when they were filming this movie. So some scenes he's super jacked, and um, it's because he was putting on weight for uh, Batman vs Superman. The magic of the movies. Now this is probably going to deal with Mank. So um, I was actually reading this particular chapter the other day. Mank is one of those Fincher movies that it's weird how many I've seen it like four times I think since it's come out it's just stuck with me in this weird way it's like obtruse in my brain um, and it's weird because I, I was really kind of lukewarm to it when I first saw it I was like oh that's good but it didn't really like wow me like a lot of the best picture nominees uh, in 2020 for the 2020 Oscars no, 2021 Oscars didn't really wow me too much. Um, but this movie really did over time. It's it's arguably probably my second favorite of the, of the Best Picture nominees that year. I, the Sound of Metal is my favorite. I would say that movie that movie really really took the cake. This movie was so interesting because like it was shot in 8K and then it was made to look like a really old movie. Um, I don't necessarily understand why Fincher shot it in 8K. <laughs> Um, but what's interesting about this, about that particular, um, section about Mank is it's almost an analysis of why Mank didn't resonate and become iconic like all the other Fincher movies prior, um, which is interesting. I don't know if I necessarily liked that essay too much, but it really is an analysis of like, did we miss something or did he miss something or did we, so, or is this just kind of not it? <laughs> It's kind of like trying to, to decode why, 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 why Mank? Why was Mank made? Why did it get the reception it got? And then we have interviews. Now, this is actually a really cool section because the interviews that are present here, I think, are very, very um, good ones for people who are fans of David Fincher and filmmaking because we have Jeff Cronenweth and we have Eric Messerschmidt and then we have 
Holt McCallany and John Carroll Lynch. Um, all there. And then I think probably one of the most, probably the two most important ones here are Jeff Cronenweth and then film editor Angus Wall for people who are really into filmmaking, you know what I mean? Because those are the, those two departments probably more than ever really are playing into how what you're being shown is shown and how long and for what purpose you're being shown those things, right? It's, it's the creation of the, it's the creation of the visual language of the story and then, and then the assembling of the story. So, yeah, you get these really, these interviews that are, that are, um, probably of great importance, uh, to read just about, you know, how they work with David Fincher and what it, and why they're doing some of the things that they're doing, which is probably the most important thing. It's always important to make sure that what, when you do something like you're making a film or whatever, somebody who makes films in their free time, right? Purposefulness will more than likely drive, um, quality. You know what I mean? If there's a purpose behind what you're doing, you will do what you can to ensure that you're portraying things in the best way um, to tell your story, right? So, yeah, it's really, so there's just interviews. There's not really anything super visually <laughs> um, astounding about this particular section. And then, uh, and then you got the acknowledgments and then basically the end of the book. So, yeah. And then we have this great still on the back of David Fincher standing there and then all of his movies named. And I'll read this for you. The cinema of David Fincher is filled with rule breakers and apex predators, with puppet masters and characters wand wondering who's pulling their strings. In David Fincher's mind game, in David Fincher mind games, Adam Naiman maps a path through the formal and psychological labyrinths of Fincher's films, from Seven and Fight Club to Zodiac and Gone Girl, to construct a detailed forensic profile of the auteur as master. This is the spine. And that is the flip through portion of David Fincher's Mind Games by Adam Naiman. Hello everyone, I hope that you guys all enjoyed that flip through of the book, um, Mind Games, David Fincher. So, here are my thoughts on this book as a whole. This book is obviously a coffee table book that is dealing exclusively in analyzing and sort of demystifying the process, the themes and sort of the art behind the films of David Fincher, right? A director that we all sort of know and love um, for many, many of his works that are really, really awesome. Uh, Fight Club, Seven, Gone Girl, uh, Curious Case of Mandarin Button, Mank, the list goes on, right? Really, really incredible, iconic films, The Social Network, and so now we have a whole coffee table book dedicated to him, which is cool. He's the one of the latest filmmakers to get like a really well thought out, well presented, well designed coffee table book. In my opinion, I think this is a very, very well designed coffee table book with a lot of information, a lot to read. If you're a person who enjoys reading, this is, I think, a really good book for you because of just the amount of words. A lot of coffee table books sometimes have very minimal text and stuff like that, even ones about filmmakers. Um, which is like, you know, it, it kind of depends on where you fall on the reading scale, so to speak. There, I think this book does have a good balance of like words to pictures and images ratio. Um, I like the idea that it's sitting through and analyzing his work. Obviously, some of that is going to come down to opinion. Um, I mentioned in the flip through the Manx section how I kind of had a little bit of trouble with the main section just because based on my own personal opinion about the book. But I, but nonetheless, even if you kind of disagree maybe with some of the author's conclusions about some of the work, um, which I think won't be the case so much with this book because I think a lot of it is, a lot of what they draw on for their writing is very well established. Um, ideas of themes um, within the the films themselves and stuff that we've heard from Fincher and stuff like that. Um, it is all based in that. So 
some that so you may vary slightly <laughs> deviate slightly from some of the opinion part of the book itself um, but nonetheless you're still getting a book that really is doing a really I, I think a solid job at analyzing those works and taking a look at exactly how all these movies sort of came together and what went into them and what I think is one of the coolest parts of the book is like the idea that you get almost a references section um, for the films right an idea of getting to see what what are the things that very clearly made an influence on not only Fincher but on the work itself on the story itself and how it's presented and I, I think that's really really awesome something I've not really seen a lot of books do in any way that's very outright other than like maybe through the text and asides and stuff of, like that so I think that's really cool the idea of getting to see a sort of demystified process of the making of these movies in some cases is really cool you obviously get to see a lot of awesome stills from the films within the book, um, which I think is great. Uh, I think it's presented well. I already said that. I think it's presented and designed well. Honestly, I do think that you should pick it up. I can't remember how much I got my copy for. I think it was somewhere around $30. So if that's an okay price that you're willing to pay for a book like this, um, then I'd say go for it. I mean, obviously, it's much bigger than a normal book. It's, it's a much different type of book. But it does have fairly a fair, fairly good amount of reading material, um, which is something I'd say is probably a little bit big for me, right? I don't want to just read nothing. I don't. I also don't want to read like a freaking novel, right? <laughs> you're you're getting this because it's a little bit, you know, more accessible to somebody who's inclined to a visual medium like film, and I think this book does a really great job at making, you know, a work that. You can use to for maybe further appreciate a, a director that you're maybe just getting into, or um, maybe learn something new and think about things in a different way than you would have previously for a director you're well acquainted with. Like me and David Fincher, I, I'm very acquainted with David Fincher's work. So getting a book like this, um, especially when I was reading the Mank section, which is his most recent work, um, you know, it gave me a, a lot of more uh, more things to think about. When, when it comes to specifically that work and, and just the works of Fincher in general and what they sort of mean, um, not only within the landscape of film, but, you know, within the landscape of his own career, right, as in a, in a vacuum, so to speak. So, yeah, I would highly recommend this book. I hope you guys, if you get it, hope you enjoy it. Um, yeah, thank you very much. This has been Ed Talks Film. And I will see you guys next time. Peace out.